Workers Credit Union Studios at Fitchburg Access Television. I'm Michael Delamonica, and this is the only formal debate this season for the fourth, Worcester Fourth District um, State uh, House seat, House of Representatives seat. And we have running in this race the incumbent, Natalie Higgins who has represented the Worcester Fourth District, which comprises the city of Leominster, uh, since 2017, and you're running for your fourth full term. And her challenger, John Dombrowski, longtime Leominster resident, local attorney, and longtime former city councilor. Welcome to both of you, and thank you for participating in this debate. We'll get right to it with opening statements. Uh, please keep the opening statement to two minutes or less. We'll start with Representative Higgins. Good evening. My name is Natalie Higgins, and I have had the pleasure of serving the city of Lemonster as your state representative since 2017. I'm grateful to the voters of Lemonster for the opportunity to represent them, and I'm proud of the accomplishments we've had in the last six years. When I first ran to be your state rep, I ran to make government more accessible and making sure it's working for Lemonster residents. Growing up in a working class family with parents who are small business owners, government wasn't a place where we could get help when they were struggling. And being accessible meant being a full-time state representative with a district office with weekly office hours in the early morning and evening hours. And my legislative aide and I have helped over 2,500 Lemonster families connect better with those vital government state resources and programs. And in the pandemic alone, we helped connect 500 Lemonster families with pandemic unemployment assistance that they needed after they were laid off. And we also supported small business owners who were trying to stay afloat during the pandemic. I'm proud to have fought for Lemonster to get the critical resources it needs for our residents and our community to thrive. In 2019, I led the effort to update our education funding formula. The Student Opportunity Act means Lemonster public schools are getting 8.2 million new dollars in state education funding this year, critical funding that will only grow in future years. Also, in this legislative session, in coordination with Senator Cronin and city officials, I've secured $2.75 in infrastructure and local projects, including Lemonster Fire Department, Police Department, Senior Center, and Veterans Housing. We've also delivered on some incredible policy wins in the last ten, uh, two years, from taking on predatory student loan borrowers with the Student Loan Borrower Bill of Rights, securing $6.5 million to help homeowners and landlords green retrofit their homes to bring down their utility costs, and teaming up with the Republican House Minority Leader to take on the State Crime Lab and hold them accountable to test the backlog of 6,300 untested sexual assault evidence kits in the state, leading to a dozen cold cases solved in the last year. I'm grateful to be here tonight, and I look forward to discussing more of our successes later in this hour. Attorney Dombrowski. Uh, yes, good evening. My name is John Dombrowski. Uh, I'm running for state representative for the uh, Worcester Fourth District. Uh, as Mr. Delamonica indicated, uh, this district is comprised solely of the city of Lemonster. Uh, I'm running as an independent. Anyone who follows the political landscape cannot help but notice the tremendous political divide that exists between the two major parties. The party's policies are being dictated by those on the far left and those on the far right. The situation is made more troublesome by the constant pandering by incumbents to special interest groups. The result has been chaos, and those of us who are in the middle, who are essentially moderates, are without a voice. It is time for change. I believe that I have a unique background that will be particularly effective at the State House. Uh, I graduated from Bentley University with a business degree, graduated from Boston University with a law degree. I've been practicing law in the city of Lemonster for about 30 years. Uh, my law firm employs 10 people. I, I know what it's like to run a small business. I know what it's like to have to meet payroll every week. As a city councilor for 18 years, I have intimate, full knowledge of all aspects of city government and all aspects of the city's budget, the city's budget and the school budget. I have two children, one with, uh, one with some special needs, I have family members that I've dealt with who've had addiction issues. I've had loved ones that I've dealt with who've had mental health issues. I understand the anguish. 
I understand the pain that people go through when dealing with these issues. I truly do. My background and my life experiences make me uniquely qualified for this position. Um, I'm very grateful to be here tonight, uh, and I'm, I'm happy uh, to be able to present my views. Thank you. First question, and I will throw out the first question. I will alternate who gets to respond first, and then the other side will have a chance for rebuttal, and if time permits, we'll have a back and forth. Um, again, as time permits, we'll start with Attorney Dombrowski. Name two positives that you believe were accomplished from the Lemonster State Rep seat this year, uh, or this previous term, I should say, and two areas of improvement that you believe are needed. Uh, two positives uh, that were accomplished by the uh, state representative. Um, one, of, one of the positives, I believe, uh, I believe that the money that the city is gonna receive from the SOARS Act uh, that's clearly a positive. That's a lot of money, uh, long overdue. Um, another positive, uh, although I don't necessarily agree with all of Representative Higgins' viewpoints, um, I do believe that she is true to herself, um, and I think that's a good way to be. Um, in the second part of your question, I'm sorry. What are two areas of improvement that are needed? Well, two areas of improvement. Uh, clearly, um, you know, the this, this, this state right now, we we're, we're have a surplus of close to th over $3 billion. Um, that means the people were overtaxed by a lot of money. That's clearly an area that needs to be improved upon. Uh, the second area that I would say, another area that I would say needs to be improved upon um, is communication um, with the mayor's office. The mayor runs the city of Lemonster. Um, he's the longest standing mayor in the Commonwealth. And in order to understand what Lemonster needs, in order to understand what, what really needs to happen to benefit the city citizens of Lemonster, you need to have communications with the mayor. My understanding um, is that the communications between the representative and the mayor are minimal at best. Uh, when I was on the council, nobody fought with the mayor more than I did. Um, but we always got things done. Uh, Representative Higgins, same question. Sure. Uh, just to answer that, that last bit, um, I talk to the mayor's office and the mayor on a regular basis, weekly, um, and I can list some of the successes that we've had in collaboration just this year. $50,000 for the Lemonster Fire Department communication upgrades, uh, $100,000 for the Lemonster Police Department mental health clinician in last year's budget, uh, $250,000 for the repair of Manusnock Brook, uh, funding for vital infrastructure projects with the mayor that he's prioritizing, $2.1 million in the infrastructure bond bill to support projects around the police station. We've had successes, and while the mayor and I don't always see eye to eye, uh, we have one job, to work together for the city of Lemonster, and I'm proud of the work that we've been able to accomplish and to come together on the things that matter the most, making sure Lemonster is getting as many resources as it possibly can get back to the city. And just to follow, <laughs> regarding the initial question, what are some areas of improvement that you if you were reelected, what were two areas of improvement that you would that you feel that you need to make? Yeah. I have been fighting for more transparency, and I think that one of the things that we need to do in the Massachusetts State House is continue to build out more transparency in the way that the process works, in the way that Lemonster voters can participate. We have made some pretty amazing progress, including remote participation, so Lemonster voters can have their voices heard. But this is one of the reasons um, that I continue to fight in the, Lemonster, in the House Rules debate to make sure that we understand um, that, that we're We've got to hear from all of our constituents and make sure that they can come to the table. Um, and, and I wish I could find some more hours in the day. Uh, we, we have a lot of work to do to get the stories of Lemonster families to make sure bills like the economic development uh, bill that we're working on to bring back tax, uh, permanent tax changes to Lemonster voters actually gets, gets done. So, Attorney Brunbrowski, just to finish up on this point, we have about a minute or so uh, with this question that I'd like to spend. You mentioned that, well, well both of you, I guess, have uh, a mixed record with the communicating with the mayor in terms of getting along with the mayor of Lemonster, as you noted, longest serving mayor uh, in Massachusetts. I guess, 
What are some ways in which you feel that, why do you feel that you would be at an advantage in communicating with the mayor's office versus Representative Higgins? Well, I think, I think uh, Representative Higgins is um, characterization of her um, communication with the mayor is is greatly exaggerated. Um, wh what I would do is I would have regular weekly meetings with the mayor's office, um, not only with the mayor's office but with different department heads, um, you know, to see that the needs of the city um, are truly being met. What can I, as a representative, do for the city? Um, and I, I don't. Th I think that is sorely lacking. Um, despite the representations being made here today. 30 seconds to respond. Yeah, I just want to hit on, on the $3 billion of uh, overtaxation. This is a 1986 law that was triggered. It is not a matter of overtaxation. It's an out-of-date um, law that, that really calculates, um, uh, that pre creates an artificial cap on revenue. I'm hoping we're going to get a chance. I know we have 30 seconds. I'm hoping we're going to get a chance to talk more about that. I think you people are reading my notes secretly <laughs> because you're not going to believe what the next question is. And I'm going to read it as I scripted it out here. State Auditor Suzanne Bump has certified the Baker administration's <laughs> estimate of 2.94 million, or billion, excuse me, in excess tax revenue that must be returned under the 1986 voter approved law known as Chapter 62F. It's the second time the law will return money to Massachusetts residents. What are your thoughts on this occurrence? Include in your answer whether you think the Chapter 62F mechanism is proper or whether another system should be used. Also include in your answer whether you believe a surplus like this one might reveal a bigger problem. Uh, we'll start with the Representative Higgins. Sure. So just to break it down a little bit more, Michael, it's a 1986 law that created an artificial cap on revenue, and it's based solely on salary and wages. It doesn't account, take into account other income like capital gains, pa pass-through income, other investment income. And during the pandemic, wages for the average worker stagnated while wealthy individuals and corporations continued to see larger returns on their investment. This disparity is what triggered this to occur. And I think we need to make sure the formula includes all income so it's up to date. But I am supporting the efforts to return these credits as quickly as possible. I am disappointed that 25% of the money will be returned to 0.6% of mass residents. That $750 million is gonna go back to the top 0.6% of wealthiest mass residents while families in Lemonster are gonna see little to no return. I've been pushing for permanent tax changes in the economic development bill that is still in consideration uh, that are going to bring $500 to $600 of annual tax savings to Lemonster families and our seniors. The wealth disparity that triggered this misalignment is one of the many reasons why I'm supporting the Fair Share Amendment. Attorney uh, Dabrowski. Um, that, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, a surplus is when you overtax if you, if you overtax people, you have a surplus. The 1986 law um, that we're talking about basically says if you hit a point where it's so high, you gotta return the money. Um, there's a couple of troubling um, things about this surplus. Um, number one, we're sitting on three, $3 billion surplus and the legislature, uh, including my opponent, can't vote to temporarily suspend the gas tax and give people some much needed relief. Um, other states have done it, including the state of Connecticut, um, and that could have helped. Uh, the other thing that's troubling is the economic development plan that, that um, uh, the representative just mentioned. Um, that's pending. Now, we have a supermajority of Democrats in the House. We have a supermajority of Democrats in the Senate. There's no reason you can't vote that in if it's gonna be so beneficial. The reason it isn't voted in is because they were counting on the $3 billion to fund it. Now they have to give the money back. So the question arises, did they, did they even know? Did they even know there was a surplus? Um, but it's a very troubling problem. Um, and you know, the, the Ways and Means Committee um, they send out monthly reports, and this is not something that happened overnight. It's something that uh, should have been realized, and it wasn't realized. Um, and the result is that the citizens of Lemonster 
at a time when inflation is at a 40-year high, we've been overtaxed. It's that simple. Representative Hughes, just to follow up on something that you said in your initial mm -hmm. answer, so you, while you support the return of the money, mm -hmm. you, th you think it should be more equitable, but also you feel that the cap itself is arbitrary. So we're Would you support raising that cap? And if so, isn't that implicitly a tax increase? If we're mm -hmm. raising the cap so that this Commonwealth gets to keep yeah. more tax money? Michael, I don't want to raise the cap. I want the cap uh, and the formula in the 1986 law to adequately rev uh, uh, reflect all of our revenues and all of those incomes that contribute to those revenues. There has been a great wealth disparity that has just been exacerbated by the pandemic in Massachusetts uh, and, and by the global economic crisis. Um, and so the average return for someone making over a million dollars is $27,000. The average return for the bottom 40% of earners which are the vast majority of Lemonster residents is less than 200 bucks, and it's one-time money. I just want to make sure that we're comparing apples to apples, that the way that wealth is being accumulated has changed. The economy is very different in 2022 to 1986. Uh, I want to make sure that the formula is actually representing our economy. All right, we need to move on to the next question. Although the pain at the gas pumps has subsided, it's not necessarily for a good reason. The storm clouds and recent market performance would indicate that we are headed into a recession and an economic slowdown. Meanwhile, although fuel prices have stabilized, inflation in general has affected the bottom line of households nationwide. So as state representative, how would you be part of the solution to get us out of this brewing crisis? Attorney Dombrowski. It, it, it's actually it's actually worse than that. The, the energy companies have essentially forecasted that energy prices are going to be going up about 63 percent. So um, you know the forecast is 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 dire. Um, I I would uh, I would support a a um, a legislation for a gas tax holiday for the first three months of 2023. Um, I would not support any increase in new taxes. Um, and getting out of a recession is about growth and development. Um, and the city of Lemonster, like, like a lot of cities and towns in the Commonwealth, um, we've got a lot of empty buildings. We've got a lot of underperforming buildings. The mall, for example, there's a big need for affordable housing. All of these types of projects create jobs. Jobs create growth, they create revenue, they get you out of a recession. The time to plan is now. The time to plan is now. We need to hit the ground running. We need to do studies. How, how, do, how can we make this mall a, a performing entity? Um, one suggestion that, that I had was to build affordable housing above the mall. That's going to help with the affordable housing issue. Um, it's going to help with uh, increasing the usability of the mall. It's going to attract better stores, better retailers to the mall. It's going to make the mall a destination point again. The infrastructure, the parking, everything is already there. Um, but but it's, it's really about, about planning now because, you know, this thing is going to happen. And you're not going to get solutions with, with political divide, okay? You're, you're going to get a one-way highway. Representative Pickens, same yeah. question. Sure, Michael. A few things to unpack. So the gas tax break sounds like a really great idea. It's not going to help people uh, in their pocketbooks. Uh, the states that have prov provided a gas tax break, that gets pocketed by these big gas companies, and we've seen it, and we have the data to show it. So we focused on making sure we could increase fuel assistance, we could increase food assistance, all of those other pieces of folks' budgets that are making it hard to ease up someplace. Um, John, it's great that you're promising no increases in new taxes, but you've been on the city council, and you voted for increases in, in new taxes. How are, you going, how are people supposed to believe that you're not gonna get in there and increase taxes uh, in a time 
where you're going to probably be hit, we're anticipating some really challenging budgets coming ahead. Um, and when it comes to empty buildings, the mayor, the mayor really loves to tout that we don't have as many empty buildings as we've, we've had. One of the challenges with development in Lemonster is we've developed so much of the city, uh, especially in the 90s. And I would love to hear what you did on your time in the city council to think about ways to redevelop the mall and bring new housing to the city of Lemonster because that is a really great role that you can play as a city councilor in that local development. I, I do want it, I'm not singling out you, Attorney Dombrowski, because you were just one of uh, nine members on city council, but Lemonster does tout itself as having fiscally conservative values, but yet it does, it has historically taken full advantage of its two and a half percent levy every year in terms of, in terms of the maximum tax increase possible on homeowners. Uh, so I'm, how would you in the state house improve on the record that maybe the mayor and the city council uh, did not do so well at? Well, I think the mayor and the city council did a, did a, did a good job. Um, the tax rate in Lemonster is far less than other cities and towns. Um, the, way, the way the tax structure works is you're not, it, it's, it's really like an algebra problem um, in Lemonster. You're talking about the property taxes. So we've got two dynamics. Um, there's been no other taxes that have been raised but you're talking about the property tax and there's two dynamics. One is homes have gone up in value. When homes go up in value, you pay more taxes. The other, the other part of that equation is when you set, the, the city council does not set the tax rate. That's, that's done by the comptroller. We are given a budget by the mayor and the comptroller and that budget is generally a bare bones budget to cover all the expenses of the, of the city. Um, and we are not allowed to add to the budget. We can decrease from the budget, but we, can't, we can cut the budget, but we can't add, for the, add to the budget. And once the budget is approved, then the tax rate is set. So there's no actual vote taken to increase taxes. Um, that, that's, that's really um, an unfair characterization. Um, having said that, uh, Getting back to the surplus, which is an overtaxation, clearly, um, despite sitting on three billion dollars, not cutting the gas tax, um, which I'm not buying that argument. I've seen the results in the state of Connecticut, which is 25 cents a gallon, that has helped save money. Um, but the legislature, at the peak. In, June, in January of 2021, at the peak of COVID, they are giving themselves a 6.46% raise. So, you know, there's a, there's a lot going on here. Uh, as far as uh, the question of, as a city councilor, what would I do to, um, um, in, in, you know, increase development, things like that. That's really not the role of the city council. The city council has a very limited role. Um, and um, what we have done is we've been presented with TIFs that we've approved to increase development. We, uh, we overrode the entire zoning bylaws in the zoning map to make it more attractive for better development. Those are things that, that can be done on the city council. Um, Going out and advocating, I mean, I guess you can advocate as a private citizen, but, but advocating for things like the idea I talked about with the mall, it's really not the role of, of a city councilor. Do we have to move on to the next question? Uh, we will start with Representative Higgins. When you're a state representative, you wear two hats. You have a hand in passing actual policy for the state and formulating, formulating political issues, but you also need to be a direct voice for your constituents. Uh, describe some ways in which you intend to deliver effective constituent services. Yeah. Go first, and Thanks. then we'll respond with Attorney I love Dabrowski. this question, Michael, because we've been doing this for the last six years, and this is honestly, for a lot of folks, they don't know what their state representative does, but the bread and butter of what we do is making government more accessible and making sure folks can access those critical state and government resources. So first and foremost, I, 
I'm a full-time state representative. This is my only job. And I have a district office with early morning and evening office hours that happen every week to make Le meet Lemonster residents uh, when they can meet me. And we have been delivering for Lemonster residents, making sure we're available by phone, through email, social media. People get really creative in getting in touch with us. And we've gone directly to their door uh, in both campaign years and non-campaign years, trying to meet Lemonster residents where they're at, knowing that a lot of folks aren't gonna call up their state rep. We're kind of that last call when they're exasperated and they've, they've kind of exhausted all of their uh, uh, supports. And I'm incredibly proud of the referrals that we get from our constituents that we've helped resolve with an issue and they send more people our way. They ask how, how uh, they can thank me for, for that help. And I say, just send other folks who you think we can help. Even if you're not sure what level of government, we can connect folks with the right resources. So being active in the community, being present, having that district office, and just delivering on constituent services day in, day out. I'm incredibly grateful for my two legislative aides uh, over the last six years, Taylor and Isabel now, uh, who, who helped me make sure that we can get folks connected to the right resource as quickly as possible. Terry Dombrowski, as a city councilor, you took those phone calls directly from uh, city residents. And so this part of the job, state rep, is a continuation of that job, constituent services. What are some ways in which you look to implement constituent services? Uh, what are some ways you wish to improve on it? Different things you want to put in place? Go ahead. No, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, uh, it's a part of the job. You know, it's a necessary part of the job. I did it as a city councilor. Um, and as a state rep, um, I think a lot of the state reps have s sort of followed the same formula. They have um, office hours. They have office hours in the evening. Uh, I know Senator Cronin um, goes to the senior center, I, I want to say, once a week. You know, I think that's invaluable to, to, uh, to help people. Um, but that's, that's what the job is. You, you, you run for this office. You run for this job. Um, for public service because you want to help people. Um, and uh, I think anyone who runs for the office, anyone who holds the office, uh, it's a noble endeavor. All right, so now this next part of the debate, we're gonna have tailored questions. Attorney Dombrowski will get a specialized question. Representative Higgins will get a specialized question. And uh, there'll be an opportunity for brief rebuttal uh, once one has answered their own question. So first for Attorney Dombrowski, your campaign literature and your platform in general uh, revolves around independence, an independent voice for Lemonster. Yet the public political positions you've taken are ones normally championed by those on the Republican side of the aisle, some of the statewide issues that you've talked about, for instance, being against the so-called illegal, illegal alien driver's license referendum, being against the so-called millionaire's tax. So for voters out there who may, may value you being an independent voice, they may value the fact that you're running as an independent, but might be wary are, can you cite any issues that are traditionally those on the left side of the aisle, the Democratic side of the aisle, that you are championing, that you are going to support if you are elected state representative? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, c civil, civil rights. Um, I'm, I am pro-choice. Uh, you know, rights, rights for workers. Um, all, all those traditional democratic values. I, I was a member of the Democratic Party up until um, about six months ago. Um, and and I, gr I grew up in that household. But the reality of this is that this is not JFK's Democratic Party. Um, and, and for that matter, it's not Ronald Reagan's Republican Party. Um, you, you only have to watch TV you know, for a half hour to see the 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 the, the vigorous um, borderline hatred between the two parties that's creating a gridlock, creating a stalemate, and and it just can't go on. Um, Massachusetts, um, you know, is is largely controlled by the Democratic Party, uh, and I feel that in many instances, um, particularly with a lot of the hot button issues. Um, they've simply gone too far. 
they've simply gone too far, which is why, you know, and I've, I've briefed a lot of these issues, um, and, uh, and, I, and what I've been trying to do, honestly, is come out on the side of common sense. A lot of these things make no sense. They make no sense to me, and, that's, and I've said that. So if they happen to fall on the Republican side of the aisle, what I believe is best for the citizens of Lemonster, then so be it. If it happens to fall on the Democratic side of the aisle, so be it, okay? This, this country, this commonwealth, this city needs to get back to basics, needs to start making common sense decisions, no more gimmicks, no more gadgets. We're not gonna solve these problems with gimmicks and gadgets. We're just not. Um, so my position is I take each issue as I see it, I research it, and I'll tell you why I support something, why I don't support something. Representative Higgins, 30 seconds or so to respond to Attorney Dombrowski's answer, and yeah. then you'll have your own question. Yeah, I'm really proud to be a Democrat in the Massachusetts State Legislature because we work on almost everything we do, even though we have a supermajority of Dems, almost everything we pass is bipartisan because we all want the same thing, our communities to be stronger and thrive. We might have some different ideas on how to get there, um, but I'm proud of the work that I've done across the aisle and an independent uh, third party organization named me one of the most central lawmakers in Massachusetts last session because of my ability to work across party lines and work with a diverse broad group of legislators regardless of their, their politics. So Representative Higgins, basically as long as I've been alive, uh, Lemonster has voted in Democrats to hold the seat of state representative, uh, whether it be more conservative, traditional JFK Democrat types like uh, Stiff Picucci or uh, even Bob Antonioni or Mary Jane Simmons who would be conservative to moderate. Uh, and in terms of your tenure on, as a state representative, you have shown a bit more of a liberal streak than some of the previous uh, state representatives. Uh, their Lemonster voters, on the other hand, tend to sometimes, they, they will vote for Democrats but have a conservative streak. Uh, for instance, there's times you've aligned with the state party, such as things like, uh, for instance, I believe you co-sponsored a bill that would eliminate parole for, or excuse me, eliminate the possibility of lifetime sentences with no parole. Mm -hmm. In other words, parole would be offered in every case. We would not ban parole mm -hmm. even for you know, murder and, 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 and things like that. And so those are positions that some have called are too liberal mm -hmm. for Lemonster. How would you respond to those who would say that you are outside the mainstream or too liberal for the Lemonster voters? Yeah. I. I have the beliefs I have because I grew up here in Lemonster in this gateway city that's a little scrappy, right? We, we have to do a lot with less. Uh, and, and I believe in solutions. This is why I ran for office, not just to spot the challenges and, and, and the hardship, but how to solve them. And we have to have real hard conversations about what those solutions look like and how do we do it in the fairest way possible uh, to make sure that folks can continue to live and thrive in our communities. Um, Turning to Dombrowski, respond. I, I think that's, uh, that answer is disingenuous. Um, and when I said um, at the beginning, uh, one of the things that I, I liked about Representative Higgins is that she's true to herself. I don't always agree with her, but, but she's true to herself. But the reality is she's, she's very progressive, very far left. Um, I, I am not, I'm more of a moderate. I don't think those positions work for the city of Lemonster. I don't think they're in the best interest of the city of Lemonster. All right, on to the next question. And this one's for uh, both of you. And we'll start with Representative Higgins. If you could just wave a magic wand and in that get any legislative bill uh, that has been proposed in the last, let's say, year or so, mm -hmm. if you could get any one of those bills passed that hasn't yet passed, which one would it be? And again, the only rule, it has to be a bill proposed within the last year that has not become law. What would it be? Yeah, what a good question. Uh, so for me, representing Gateway City, Lemonster, thinking about opportunities, um, the legislation that I'm really proud to work on is debt-free public higher education, creating an opportunity for community members from Lemonster to have an equal shot at a future. I'm a proud first-generation college student, the 
my dad didn't have the opportunity to finish high school. For me to be able to, to benefit from the Lemister Public School System, go to UMass Amherst and get my law degree, right? Like that is the American dream and the dream we hope for folks coming out of Lemonster. My brother uh, got his associate's degree at Mass Bay Community College. That opportunity opened amazing doors for both of us. And we need to make sure that Lemonster residents have access. While 50% of Massachusetts residents have access uh, to, to a bachelor's degree, less than a third of our residents do. And in most gateway cities, it's less than a quarter. It's holding our communities back. And one of the number one things we've heard throughout that coming out of the pandemic and with this economic crisis is workforce challenges and finding enough workers with the right skill sets, investing in public higher ed, something that we did up until the early 90s so that folks could go to school and not take on enormous debt um, is something that's going to unlock that potential for all of our neighbors to do better. And so this is a, I guess, what specific bill are you yeah. speaking of that maybe hasn't become law yet that yeah. would, would, would foster what you're yeah, so I, I introduced supporting. a piece of the legislation you, with Jamie you, Aldridge, you Senator okay. Jamie Aldridge, that is debt-free public higher education. Understood. Okay. All right, Attorney Dombrowski, same question. Or first of all, do you have any response to um, to um, Representative Higgins's answer? No, I, I can okay. I can answer the so question. So same question. Same question. I, I if I had a magic wand, I would um, I would hope that the Commonwealth would have established uh, some of the health care reforms um, that have taken place in other countries. Uh, health care uh, is, is abysmal. Not, not health care, health insurance. Okay. Health insurance is abysmal. Um, and it seems like every time you turn around, it gets worse and the rates go up. Uh, and and the, the, the latest craziness is um, the establishment of deductibles that are so expensive that you you might as well not have health insurance. Uh, so, you know, for example, I, I, I know an individual, um, so her health plan calls for a $5,000 deductible. She can't get any health insurance until she's paid that $5,000. She doesn't have $5,000. So she essentially doesn't have health insurance. And she can't take advantage of a lot of the mass, uh, uh, mass health because she has access to health insurance. And, and, and these are the kind of problems that, that people, um, not just in Massachusetts, across the country are, are facing. So if I had that magic wand, um, that, that's what I would use it for. Now, some of the things been floated about historically, because of course Massachusetts uh, was the birthplace of Romney Care, which was the precursor to Obamacare, sort of a, a controlled, mandatory insurance, but sort of a private-public partnership, so to speak. And the next logical step, something that's been uh, bantied around in the state legislature over the years, a Medicare for all type option or a single-payer type option. Or, uh, or, so are you saying that you would support looking into something like that? I, I, I would. I most certainly would. Okay. All right. Uh, Representative Higgins, any response to that? No, the single payer option is a bill that I've co-sponsored. It's something we agree on and it actually will save our small businesses an incredible amount of money uh, when it comes to health insurance is sometimes one of their biggest overhead costs. All right, point of agreement. Great. Uh, winter is just around the corner and the winter brings challenges to our roads, our sidewalks that other states may not face. Yet Chapter 90, the primary state funding mechanism for municipal roadways, has not seen an appreciable increase in funding for over a decade. Fix the roads is a refrain that we hear often as a result. Uh, citizens of Lemonster, Fitchburg, Gardner, Central Massachusetts, we seem to really get hit with the potholes every spring. As a state representative for the upcoming term, what is your idea? What can you bring to the table for fixing this problem? And I believe it is um, Attorney Dombrowski's turn. It's just, just strong advocacy. I mean, it's a problem every city and town faces. Um, and along with that, with, with Lemonster's unique, um, we have three drinking water resources, one of which, no town, is located um, right off of Route 2. And um, the salt and other additives that they put on the road are often going into the No Town Reservoir as the as the seasons change and it gets warmer and it creates, 
you know, problems with the drinking water that the city has to pay for out of its dime. But, but strong advocacy, there is a need um, to change the formula. The formula is largely based on accepted roads. Um, so Commonwealth of Massachusetts has been around a long time. There are a lot of roads that are out there that the city plows, um, but they're not accepted roads. Uh, be because they're they're too windy. Uh, if you go, I forget the name of it, but it's 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 like the bad president's subdivision in Lemonster. It's named after uh, Pierce and Garfield and all these streets. But all those roads are these tiny roads, you know, 18 feet wide that don't have proper drainage, don't have um, you know proper drainage, don't have uh, uh, proper width. Would never pass. Um, what is required to be in that formula, um, but people live on them. All, 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 all throughout the city we have this problem. So, so one key thing that could be done is to relax that definition so that the city of Lemonster could add all of those roads to that equation, to that formula. And again, it, it's, it's an antiquated formula. It definitely needs to be looked at. Uh, and in, the, in a city uh, like Lemonster, where you know we're in the snow belt, um, and that's and that's something that I, I think it's a good point you raise, and it's something that should be done. Well, if the formula were changed, the extra money has money has to come from somewhere. Correct. And you have taken a stance against revenue enhancement, tax increases, so to speak. Where do you see the source of funding coming from? Uh, and if we're going to basically result in raising this, these chapter ninety, this 90, chapter ninety allocation. Well, I think, I, I, I think, Michael, you're assuming that all this money is being spent wisely. Um, if let's 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 just take a, a step back and, and look at things. Uh, I was on the city council for eighteen years. Um, screaming about the net school spending formula. We need more money, we need more money. This formula is antiquated. Um, the formula gets updated and all of a sudden, not only Lemonster, but every municipality gets a chunk of money. Where did that money come from? Where did that money come from? How, how do we have a $3 billion surplus and we, d we, don't even, we didn't really even know it? Because if you knew it, you wouldn't have that economic development plan hinging on it. The money's there. It needs to be spent more wisely. Representative Higgins, been there the last six years. The Chapter 90 mm -hmm. has been flat funded or hasn't, haven't seen an increase of any sort. What do we do about it? The House tried last session, and it kind of died in the Senate. Uh, but we really do need to increase the funding for Chapter 90 and for our roads and infrastructure. And uh, while John can point out the problem, I've got the solution. The Fair Share Amendment will raise $2 billion for education and transportation every year, taking off the pressure off our middle class families and just the top half of a percent 0.0003% of Massachusetts res uh, Lemonster residents are gonna be subject to this. Uh, and it's gonna give us the vital resources we need when it comes to transportation funding, just to get Massachusetts to a good state of repair. We need to invest $2.5 billion, $2 billion a year over the next 25 years. That is a huge investment. We've gotta have real conversations about how we're gonna fund it. And this is why business owners are supporting the Fair Share Amendment, folks who would be subject to the tax because they want better roads. They want this investment in their public infrastructure and their businesses will benefit from better roads to move their goods and their employees. Let's talk a little bit about the fair share amendment, middle, uh, middle or millionaire's tax, bunch of different names for it. Uh, let's talk about that a little bit. No matter what we call it, mm -hmm. it's essentially changing the taxation system in Massachusetts so instead of one flat rate for everyone, you now have the ability to do progressive rates, different rates for different income classes, just like the federal government mm -hmm. has done for years and years. So I'll start with Representative Higgins, then I'll give Attorney Dombrowski a chance to respond. Sure. How, do, how can we trust the state of Massachusetts 
which has certainly wiggled and waffled and weaseled out of things before in terms of promises about taxes. How can we ensure that Massachusetts is not going to, this, this referendum passes, we, mm -hmm. have a, we have a progressive tax system now, and suddenly, a few years down the road, the increased tax rate is not just above for people making above a million dollars a year, it's for people making above $200,000 a year. And then maybe a couple of years later, it's for people making 100 or 75 or 50. How do we know that the state's not going to do that? Michael, just to get back to a little bit of basics with the Fair Share Amendment, this isn't a regular ballot question. This is a constitutional amendment that requires the support of two back-to-back -back legislative sessions, over 100,000 supporters uh, from, from Massachusetts voters. Um, and we've been working on this a long time. I was actually working on this when I was running uh, the nonprofit I ran uh, to make sure that we were getting the, edu the education funding that we needed. And so in order to change this, we would have to go through an entirely new constitutional amendment process. So it's a very long process, it's resource heavy, and so it's protected in our constitution. It's not just a law that the legislature can change. We would all have to change it as voters of Massachusetts. The bracket itself, yep. not just, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's going to be written into the constitution. Uh, and so it's, and what's even better is that it's putting where that money is going to be spent for the quality, for resources for quality public education and affordable public colleges and universities and for the repair and maintenance of our roads, bridges, and public transportation, right? It is written into the Constitution. We cannot change that as a legislature. The only way we would change it is if we, as a whole state of voters, came together and said we needed to change the constitutional amendment. Attorney Dombrowski, you were going to say something about taxation before I uh, moved on to this question. You can say what you were going to say then, but also you can respond to, you have come out specifically in opposition to this uh, referendum question. Okay, yeah. so not, why don't you explain your position, how it differs from attorney, uh, excuse me, yeah. from representative. Not Harris. just me, but the, but the Boston Globe this morning had a headline story about it. Um, this is a gimmick, okay, nothing, nothing more than that. Uh, it's an additional tax of 4% on personal income, uh, which is essentially a doubling of that tax. Um, and it's deceptive um, because it's not just applying to salaried positions. It's applying to one-time transactions. Somebody works their whole life. They pay off their home. They have their own business. They want to retire. They've been paying taxes their entire life. Um, they've been paying their fair share their entire life and now they want to retire their homes have all gone up in value they sell their home they sell their business now they're subject to this tax and mind you when I say it's a gimmick it's a gimmick this this tax is only going to affect maybe maybe 300 people in the Commonwealth of those 300 people a hundred of them are in the situation that I just discussed, maybe more. The rest of them are at an income point level where they can simply change their residence. Massachusetts, since 2021, Massachusetts is at a five-year high of people moving out of Massachusetts to low-tax states like New Hampshire, North Carolina, and Florida. With the exception of Hawaii, Massachusetts is the costliest place to do business in the United States. And this is gonna make it harder. Um, if, if, you, if, you wanna, if, if, if you wanna have a tax like this, it has to be a federal mandate. It's only worked, it's only worked in New York and California, and the reason it works in those two states really is the celebrity identity and the people who want to be in New York City and they want to be in California because of those unique environments. Massachusetts, it's not gonna work. In fact, when those people move out, now, in, in, with this remote learning situation, with this remote uh, job, people working remotely, um, it's, it's, all, it's all even easier to move out. And when they move out, not, to, not only do you not get the 4% that you're trying to whack them with, you, you, don't get the, you don't get the underlying 4% either. So I think it's a gimmick. Uh, I don't think it's gonna work. Um, and, and I think it's just, a, it's just a way for someone to say they have a solution when they really don't. 
You got unintended a consequences pencil. is what is what Attorney Dabrowski is talking about. Unintended con and we see that when when a, a, a Congress or legislation has passed law, there's been unintended consequences. Why wouldn't there be unintended consequences with this one? Michael John Selling, Massachusetts, so short. We have a lot of celebrity status, and and folks move to Massachusetts because we have great public resources. We have great public education system. We're a great place for businesses to be. And I'll just drop one celebrity for Peter, who, my husband, who's in the green room. Kevin O'Leary, if folks watch uh, Shark Tank, Peter's a big Shark Tank fan. Kevin O'Leary calls Massachusetts his home because he wants to live here. Uh, and, and we have research and there's data that shows of the folks who are subject to this new proposed tax, more than half of them already support it. And they think it's the fair thing because this is only folks who are earning more than $20,000 a week. They're doing okay. And honestly, they've been doing even better um, and their wealth has been growing while most folks have been really struggling to make ends meet. And it's going to be invested in things that we all benefit from, our education system and our, and our public tra uh, transportation roads and bridges. 20 seconds response, yeah. Yeah, just, just one response, and this was highlighted in the Boston Globe article today. The fact that they're saying that this is a constitutional guarantee, um, again, is disingenuous, because the reality is the money that's already going to those endeavors is subject to be taken away if you have this fair share tax. So there's no, there's really no guarantee that that's going to happen. Michael, I hope you get a chance to check out the Globe article. The headline was a little misleading, but it really Please. focused on, there's a lot of debate of where it can go and how we split this money between education and transportation, early ed, higher ed, K-12, oh. public transit. That's where the debate is gonna be happening. Well, I would suggest that this sounds like this Globe article, it sounds like people need to take a look at and uh, make up their own minds based on what's in it. So we'll get to the last question, then we'll go to uh, closing statements. The highly publicized U.S. Supreme Court case of Dobbs versus Jackson in a five to four decision overturned the long-standing case of Roe versus Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey. Those cases, in essence, forbade states from banning abortions within the first trimester of a pregnancy. To say it's a hot button issue is an understatement. If elected state representative for this upcoming term, do you intend to propose or are you willing to co-sponsor any legislation related to what the Supreme Court did? whether it be consistent with the court's decision or contrary to the court's decision. I judge from some of your preliminary answers what it's going to be, so let's hear some, in terms of what side you fall on, but let's hear some specifics. Uh, Attorney Dombrowski. I, I've been pro-choice uh, my entire adult life. Um, I thought the Supreme Court decision was a, was, was a disaster. Uh, it's a terrible decision, it's a terribly written decision, it's a terribly researched decision. Um, so I, I would be um, certainly in favor of legislation that would be against the Supreme Court decision. Um, I, I can't imagine even being in those circumstances where you're contemplating that type of life-changing decision. Um, so I, I am pro-choice, I've always been pro-choice and that's, that's my position. Representative Pickens. Incredibly proud that the House led the effort to make sure that we were strengthening our protections, not only for folks seeking abortion care, but for providers of abortion care, and that we had bipartisan support in shoring up all of those uh, protections within uh, two weeks of, of the decision coming down. Massachusetts will continue to provide care and be there to support our neighbors who might be losing access to this care as a result of this decision. Well, folks. Hour goes by fast, and it's now time for closing statements. And so, based on the time here, you'll each get uh, two, two and a half minutes to make your closing pitch to the voters of Lemonster. Attorney Dombrowski, go ahead. Uh, yes, I, I'd like to thank uh, Mike Delmonica and, and Flap TV for hosting this debate. Uh, I'd also like to thank Natalie Higgins for participating in, in what I believe was a very good discussion. Um, on the relevant issues and questions. For the, for the past few years, I, I've been studying the political landscape um, and the votes and policies that have been taken by the Massachusetts legislature, uh, including my opponent. Um, I, I found that there's one recurring theme. It doesn't make any sense. Inflation is at a 40-year high and our legislature has overtaxed us by $3 billion. 
doesn't make any sense. Beacon Hill is sitting on a $3 billion surplus, and unlike other states, they vote not to temporarily suspend the gas tax to give us some much needed relief. It, it doesn't make any sense. According to the Federation of American Immigration Reform, illegal immigration costs the Commonwealth of Massachusetts $1.8 billion a year. My opponent and the majority of the state legislature support Massachusetts being a sanctuary state, which only leads to increased illegal immigration. It doesn't make any sense. You want to fix the immigration problem, you need to lobby your congressmen to reform the immigration laws. Governor Baker vetoed legislation that would give undocumented immigrants driver's licenses on the grounds that it would increase illegal immigration and the very basic fact that Massachusetts Registry of Motor Vehicles does not have the ability to properly authenticate people's identifications, which means that in post-911 America, the state of Massachusetts would be giving legitimacy to people that they can't properly identify. It doesn't make any sense. I could go on all day. I'm running as an independent candidate. Several people along the way have told me that I, I can't win as an independent. Let me tell you, we need change. For the good of the country, for the good of the Commonwealth, for the good of the city, we need to get away from this party gridlock. I can't do it is not a refrain that was recognized by our founding fathers and our leaders. We can do it, we need to do it, we will do it. I, uh, I have a son who has, um, some special needs. So when he was a kid, it was always difficult to get him in, into different activities. Um, you know, you're always worried, he's, he's not gonna fit in, it's not gonna work, he's gonna create problems, he's gonna be ostracized. Uh, when he was five or six years old, um, we had him at Rickers Kinder Camp on the west side of Lemonster. Uh, and that camp was run by my old high school coach, Lee Ricker, and his family. Um, and I remember driving one day to pick, to pick up my son. Um, and there's always some trepidation, you know, and every time he pulled into that parking lot, did he do okay? You know, was he excluded? Was he ostracized? Were there problems? And, uh, and I was talking with Mr. Ricker, with Coach Ricker, and, and I said, how did he do today? And, and Coach Ricker, um, he paused for 30, 30 seconds, 60 seconds, which, which is a long time when you're standing there having a conversation with an adult. And then, and then he said to me, he said, Johnny is a work in progress, but so are you and so am I. I've, I've never forgotten those words. Um, this, this country is a work in progress. This commonwealth is a work in progress. We cannot stay in this two-party gridlock anymore. It's time for independent voices on Beacon Hill, and there is no reason, there is no reason that this cannot start in Lemonster. I want to thank everybody for viewing tonight. All right. All right. Go ahead, Ms. Uh, Representative Higgins. We'll give you a little extra time to comport with Karen Dombrowski's time. I'm going to try to get us back on time. Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, I have a proven track record of bringing state resources to Lemonster, working with our local, federal, and state delegations, including both Democratic and Republican leadership. I'm proud of the progress we've made over the last six years on issues such as making government more accessible, education funding, student debt, mental health, ending sexual and domestic violence. I will continue fighting for Lemonster as your full-time state representative, and I'm asking for your vote again this November. If you want to get involved and you want to learn more, check out electnataliehiggins.com. If you have a question and you want to talk with me directly, call me at 978-602-3772. Thank you so much for your time and thank you for hosting this debate.
Thank you both for participating in this debate. And the voters of Lemonster really have no reason to not go out and vote. We have two eloquent, well-qualified candidates here, so go out there and make your decision. Uh, until next time, Michael Delamonica signing off for Flap TV.